Please join me in this uh, confession of faith, responsive confession of faith, uh, which comes from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. These are questions two and three. What role hath God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach man to most of you. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. Hear God's word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. God, may you speak to us through the reading and preaching of your word. And may the name of Christ ever be praised. Amen. Americans increasingly reject the divine authorship of the Bible. The statistics over the years have not been promising. They are not going in what we think the right direction would be. Many now view the Bible in the same category as other religious writings. So most of you are probably familiar with uh, Ligonier Ministry. That's the ministry uh, began by R.C. Sproul. They have uh, what they call the State of Theology which is a like biannual nationwide survey. Their most recent survey, which was 2022, suggests that this sort of view, that the Bible is just in the same category as other religious writings and sacred texts, this sort of view makes it easier for individuals to accept biblical teachings that resonate with themselves or maybe resonates with the culture while simultaneously rejecting any biblical teaching that is, of course, seen as passé. They discovered in 2022, the most, uh, the most recent study, that 53% of Americans agree with this statement. The Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. 53% of Americans agree with that statement. Now, they also do varied statistics. So they broke it down and they said, well, what about just evangelical Christians? How many evangelical Christians agree with this statement? The Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. Well, the statistic among evangelicals should be like 0%, right? 26% of evangelical Christians agree with that statement. And of course, there has been copious amount of writings and studies done that have shown that an alarming amount of people who leave faith after going to college is often associated with a lack of understanding of Scripture and a deeper understanding of, of what is Scripture's nature, right? What is the nature of Scripture? They don't understand what Scripture is, and they don't understand what is in Scripture. So we have a problem today in our culture, and the church is not exempt from it. We are starved not only, not only of an understanding of the pages of Scripture, but what Scripture is. So tonight... I just want to look at these two aspects of Scripture. The points are in your uh, bulletin. I just want to look at the nature of Scripture and the content of Scripture. First, it's nature. One, Scripture, it's inspired. It's inspired. Inspired by God literally means God, God breathed. The words of Scripture are breathed out by God who used human authors as they wrote them down. So you have other religions that believe things close to this, right? So uh, Islam 
believes that God, or Allah, he dictated these words, and their prophet, Muhammad, simply wrote down what was dictated. This has been called uh, mechanical inspiration or dictation theory. Okay? Some Christians believe, erroneously or incorrectly, that this is how our Bible was inspired. However, this is not what the Bible teaches. The Holy Spirit wrote Scripture harmoniously with human authors as he inspired them to record his words perfectly. Okay, so God, he prepared authors and the circumstances which shaped those authors, and then they spoke and wrote according to their own personalities and circumstances, yet so in a way that their words were the very words of God. So when you read David's poems, they read very differently from the Apostle Paul's, right, logical explanations of doctrine. But both are God's words entirely, okay? Second, as far as Scripture's nature, it's a revelation. It reveals everything we know about God and life has been revealed to us by God. Uh, when God speaks, he reveals, and, and to reveal simply means to to unveil, or to show something that was previously concealed. So God reveals himself, Scripture says, in many ways, right? He reveals himself through nature. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. God has revealed himself in ancient times through the prophets, through dreams and visions, he reveals himself, of course, in Scripture. And Hebrews says that his revelation is seen clearly right, in Jesus becoming a human. Long ago, many times, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Right? So God has not left us without witness, but he reveals himself to us. So about Scripture's nature, it's inspired, it's a revelation, and three, it's trustworthy. It's trustworthy. There are a host of things that demonstrate Scripture's trustworthiness. Um, you can read the uh, uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, and it, it speaks about all of these aspects of Scripture that show it to be trustworthy, right? It's coherent. It tells one single story over multiple authors. You have people's own testimonies regarding Scripture. You have Scripture's beauty, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But the common attack on Christianity today is, well, this Christian's holy book, it's unreliable. You know, scribes, they, they mess things up over the years while they were copying Scripture. In... Late 1946, Bedouin teenagers were tending their goats and sheep near uh, an ancient settlement of Qumran. Uh, I've actually been there. Kelsey and I, we've, we've climbed the, the hills there at Qumran. We've seen these caves. But um, they were located northwest on the shore of the Dead Sea. And, and you probably know this story. One of the young shepherds took a rock and he tossed it into an opening on the side of a cliff into a cave, and he was surprised when he heard a shattering sound. So they, uh, him and his companions, they entered into the cave, and they found a collection of, of large clay jars containing leather and papyrus scrolls. Over all those generations, the scrolls were preserved by being in the jars. An antiques dealer, of course, bought the cachet, and he, it ultimately ended up in the hands of various scholars who estimated that these texts were over 2,000 years old, before the time of Christ. After word of the discovery got out, Bedouin treasure hunters and archaeologists, they scoured Qumran, and they ended up unearthing tens of thousands of additional scrolls and fragments from 10 nearby caves. Together, they made up between 800 and 900 manuscripts. We've basically compiled the entire Old Testament from these scrolls. I think the book of Esther was the only one that wasn't recovered. They had the entire scroll of Isaiah. I've actually been to the museum over in Israel, and I've looked at the scroll. But 
what came out of that is liberal scholars were, were so excited about this find because now that they could finally show all of these Christians just how unreliable their Bibles were. How did that turn out? <laughs> After the manuscripts were studied, they found only minute differences. <laughs> Little grammatical things, nothing that changed the meaning of anything in our Old Testament. The reliability of the New Testament manuscripts is unparalleled. 5,686 partial and complete Greek manuscripts. Over 10,000 Latin Vulgates, 9,000 other early versions, over 25,000 copies of books of the New Testament, some going back just to 100 years after Christ. It is the, the Bible is the most attested ancient manuscript that we have today. The closest ancient manuscript that is anywhere near as attested as ours is Homer's Iliad with 643 copies. And the earliest manuscript is from the 13th century AD. My point here is that scripture is reliable. It is the means by which we know who God is, who we are in light of that, and through these means, we know what his revealed will and moral law are. We know who, who God is and thus how we can glorify him or how we should glorify him. If our chief end is to glorify and enjoy God forever, we better grow in this relationship by knowing who God is. What are his likes and dislikes? And conforming our lives around this. No one is higher than God. Therefore, the Bible is the standard of all standards. It is judged by no other standard. The Bible is what Puritan Thomas Watson called the, quote, rule of faith, a canon to direct our lives. The word is the judge of controversies, the rock of infallibility that is only to be received for truth, end quote. It's inspired by God. It's a revelation, and it's trustworthy. Moving on to our second point, it's content. The Bible essentially teaches us two things, right? Who God is and what is required of us. What man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. First, who God is. If the source of scripture is the divine, our, our creator and our Lord, then it reveals or unveils, it tells us something of his identity, right? We see his acts throughout history. If you really want to, to know who someone is, right, what do you do? You, you spend time with them. Right? You, you listen to their words. You see how they act. <laughs> do how they act. Is, is that consistent with their words? How do they react to adversity? So anytime God has intervened throughout redemptive history or spoken through a prophet, we get to see who God is. You know, so much of our Bible is narrative. It's history. And Oftentimes, you'll read about these histories, but then there'll be no comment on how we should interpret it, right? Because we, we learn how God interacts with people throughout history, and then we begin to see who he is. What is his character like? Oh, he judges sin. <laughs> he saves his people. He's faithful. Sometimes... He just outright tells us a little bit about himself, right? Uh, like when he told Moses, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Right? There's a, a list of who God is. Or other times the Lord gives us his laws, right? Which are a direct reflection of his character. God is not accountable to, to any laws. Rather, the laws come from him. They're a reflection of his character, right? God, these, there's not these laws God are obeying. The laws are reflective of God's character. We are prohibited from lying. Why? Because God is truth. We are prohibited from infidelity because God is faithful. We are, prohibiting, we are prohibited from murder 
Because God is life. R.C. Sproul wrote that, quote, God acts according to his own moral character. His own character is not only morally perfect, it is the ultimate standard of perfection. His actions are perfect because his nature is perfect, and he always acts according to his nature. God is therefore never arbitrary, whimsical, or capricious. I think we talked about that this morning. Uh, I, I just thought of this right now. Uh, I, knew a, I have a friend who, back in Lancaster City, he was homeless. He was a heroin addict. And uh, uh, he has a, a really troubled past, but an amazing testimony. And someone gave him an R.C. Sproul book. <laughs> this homeless guy on the streets, dealing drugs, hurting people. And he read the book and converted Right? God works through any means he pleases. Uh, and then he took, uh, eventually he, um, after years of studying scripture, he went back into the streets to do ministry. And someone asked him, well, uh, isn't it sinful what God did in the Old Testament with the Canaanites and the conquest? And he had the best answer. He, he told all of these people in the street, uh, no. And they said, well, why? And he said, because God did it. Nothing God does is sinful because it's in accord with his character. So scripture is the unfolding witness of, of who God is. And um, all the scriptures, here's another thing, all the scriptures point us to Christ. All the scriptures point us to Christ. It's not that we just get to the New Testament and boom, there he is. And then we read the Old Testament like moralists, right? This is what we should do. This is how we should. No, like the Old Testament is speaking of Christ too. Um, Jesus said to the religious people who were persecuting him, he said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now, when Jesus was saying this, the New Testament wasn't written yet. So what was he speaking about? The Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. In another interaction, uh, Jesus says, Luke 24, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, right? They must be fulfilled. They speak of him. That's the three divisions we have of the Old Testament, right? The law, the prophets, the poetry. They all tell us about Jesus. Uh, I first came across this about 13 years ago. I, this never dawned on me till then. And all of a sudden, I, I had an entirely new Old Testament to read. Because now I, could, I can read the New Testament in light of Jesus. So when you read about Adam and Eve, it's telling you about Jesus. That Jesus is the greater Adam who passed the test of temptation in his garden and whose obedience, not disobedience, his obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the greater Abel who was innocent and slain, but his blood cries out not for our condemnation, but our acquittal. Jesus is the greater Abraham, who left his home and came to the land of Israel to create, to form a new people of God. Jesus is the greater Moses, who mediates a relationship between God and his people. Jesus is a greater Moses, who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the greater David, who slays our greatest enemy, our greatest giant, sin. He is our king, and we share in that victory, even though we didn't toss one stone. All of the scriptures speak of Jesus. The Old Testament, then, we can read it and know. It's, it's looking forward. It's telling us something about Jesus and the work he's going to do. We read about the, the lambs being sacrificed. And the whole sacrificial system, the temple, the priests, the kings, the prophets, and we see something predictive of Jesus. Last then, how should we then live? Right? Logic dictates that if Scripture is inspired by God and it's trustworthy, and if Scripture teaches us who God is and it's his word, then it's authoritative. It's authoritative. 
Now, this means that we should live in light of who God is. Um, through a relationship with my wife, I grow to know her better from her words, from her actions. Uh, when, when you get married, right, your spouse begins to reveal themselves to you. That's, that's part of a marriage, that you, you grow as one, you, you know each other better, you know um, how you can treat them in a way that demonstrates honor and, and love. You know your spouse's likes and dislikes, and you, you try to conform your life around those. Scripture is how we know God more deeply, how we grow to know him as we commune with him, commune with him in worship and prayer and our spiritual disciplines. We begin to know who is our wonderful God. What is he like? How can I honor him and love him better with my words, with my actions? And... Um, you know, as far as this last part of the confession, what duty God requires of man, right? Well, there's, there's a lot here, right? There's a lot to learn. But it's because of this that, that all of Scripture then is useful for teaching, instructing us, for rebuke, for correction, for, for training in righteousness. It corrects us when we are wrong, knowingly or unknowingly. It rebukes us when we are in rebellion. I, I remember... Uh, it's two years ago, I brought this up to my class, my theology class that I was teaching. Um, I remember reading scripture just two years ago, and I came across something that I had believed differently. And I came across it in the passage, and I started studying it, and, and I came to the conclusion I was wrong, and scripture was right. So at that point, you're at a crossroads, right? Do, do I change what I think, which you should, <laughs> or do I just try to explain this away, right? And uh, well, I ended up coming to the conclusion I was wrong, and I repented. And I was explaining this to my theology class last school year, and they said, well, what was it? And I couldn't remember. Um, but uh, Scripture reserves that right because it's, it's authoritative. Paul says, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture, at the end of the day, it makes us complete, and thoroughly equipped for every good work, right? God has good work set before us. Uh, the word for complete means uh, proficient, uh, perfect, like perfect in its kind, in like a moral category, what is, what is right and what is good. So scripture, in other words, it actually improves us. What's broken and, and polluted in us because of sin's damaging and corrupting effects. Scripture then being worked into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, it actually re reconstructs us. This is an important point. I'll, I'll end on this. God's word directs us how to live. But more than that, it improves our inner being so we can live that way. It's not just what duty God requires of man, but then the Holy Spirit works Scripture into man to do that duty. It's still a grace of God, and it's wonderful because, brothers and sisters, I can't do the duties that are in here on my own. Right? We need God's grace and his Spirit working that in us. It improves our inner being. God's words are actually a balm to our soul. This is why the psalmist says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. He stores the word of God in his heart so that he might not sin against the Lord. Or Psalm 1, those who delight in the law of the Lord and they meditate on it day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. There's that image of, of the tree planted, deeply rooted by streams of water. I, I have these big trees behind my home. And uh, I was staying with Charlie and Linda, I don't know, about a month ago. And they were telling me the story of the tree falling on their home. And the first thing I did 
when I got to our house on Vicklin Street is I looked at the trees behind our home and I'm like, what do those roots look like? That's the man or the woman who delights and meditates on the law of the Lord. They are deeply rooted. They are like the, the tree planted by streams of water and they yield its fruit. So there's, there's a fruitfulness there. That's at the heart of reading Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful uh, that you have not left us without witness, but that you have given us your word, uh, that it is a light and a lamp to our feet and our path, uh, that you are working your word into us as we sing it, as we pray it, as we hear it preached, as we uh, read it in our Bible studies, as we read it in our devotions, as we hear it preached. Lord, work your word into us. May we store your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you, that you would find us faithful to the duties you require of us, not because of our own work, but the work and grace of the Spirit working within us. To you all honor and glory. Amen. Uh,